Well, looks like we've got our group from yesterday. Would you mind if we started a little bit early? Okay. We have the luxury of time at a conference like this. Uh, not because the sessions are so short, but because we have time away from the pressures of uh, preparing the classroom, preparing things for school life, so that we can focus on things. Uh, not exactly a retreat atmosphere, because there's so many things going on, but we have time to actually consider um, some of these things. I don't know about you, but on occasion I feel guilty about doing things for me when there are so many things to do for the parish or for the school, or for CCLE for that matter. Um, we get a focus on the Apostles' Creed to begin with. Uh, second century AD, it's based off of the old Roman Creed from circa 215, which sounds something like this. I believe in God the Father Almighty and in Christ Jesus, His only Son, our Lord, who was born from the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, who was under Pontius Pilate, was crucified and buried, on the third day rose again from the dead, ascended into heaven, sits at the right hand of the Father, whence He will come to judge the living and the dead, and in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Church, the remission of sins, the resurrection of the flesh. It sounds odd to hear the old Roman creed because we know of the extra words that were added to what we call the Apostles' Creed. The Apostles' Creed faithfully reflects the teaching of Jesus' own apostles, but contrary to the medieval myth, the 12 apostles did not each provide one line. The joke goes, well, which line did Judas contribute? We can safely ignore that one. No. But we can thank Dr. Luther for being the one who properly distinguishes um, the three articles as we have them in the small catechism. So in uh, your book of Concord, we've got one more up by the window if you'd like to follow along. You'll find the Apostles' Creed very near the beginning of the book. And uh, let's in particular focus on the text of Article 2. And, I believe, in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day He rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence He will come to judge the living and the dead. When I teach a new member class for adults at Emmanuel Sheridan, one of the things I've found that works rather well is to read through the Gospel according to Matthew. Now, I went to St. Louis. I had Dr. Gibbs for Greek, for interpretation, and for Matthew. But at a uh, continuing ed event in Jackson Hole, I got to hear a presentation on Matthew and James by Dr. Skayer. What a lot of people don't know is he vickered in Wyoming. He got to preach in Teton Park at Jenny Lake, and he was at Dubois. And the congregation survived. It's still there. Don't you worry. But he had, uh, he'd come out in part to fill in at the last minute for the speaker that we had anticipated. And it wasn't until the third day that uh, we figured out it was a presentation on both Matthew and James. But he said something about Matthew that was just so obvious. Matthew was written to teach people the faith. Yeah? Oh, well, why not use Matthew to teach people the faith? You can read chapter 1. It gives all that Old Testament history and some of the obscure names and many of the familiar names. You get to Christmas finally, and then I go to the Catechism, second article of the Creed. The second session, you can read through chapters 3 and 4. You get introduced to John the Baptizer and Holy Baptism. You can go to the Catechism for the first time and talk about baptism. By that point, you're used to reading things. It's a safe place um, 
for folks that are reviewing the faith, coming in from a different tradition, or as is the case, at least up in Sheridan, about half of the people I baptize are grown adults that have no background whatsoever. You can read through Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, introduce the commandments, introduce the Lord's Prayer. The Catechism teaches itself when you use Matthew that way. So focusing on the second article of the Apostles' Creed happens very early in my catechesis of new members. There are some words that uh, Missouri Synod Lutherans and others do tend to trip over. One of those is... Catholic. Have you noticed that? The Latin text um, says Catholica, but at least in the German Missouri Synod, we come by a uh, holy Christian church in an honest way. I'm told pre-Reformation, Catholica was translated Christlich in the German, and when we transitioned to English, Christlich became Christian, with a capital C. But were we to use Catholic, we would, as on my slide here, use the small c. Not as in Roman Catholic, but as in universal. What has already always believed, been believed, taught, and confessed about scripture, God, Jesus, salvation, you name it, from the scriptures. So all of the invented things, like the assumption of Mary into heaven, which is too big of an assumption in my opinion, um, or praying to saints, angels, purgatory, all of this uh, kind of stuff can be safely ignored because it is not truly Catholic. In Lutheran service book, you will find different footnotes when it comes to the creeds, especially in the back of the hymnal. That's one of the easiest places uh, to find this. Um, the Apostles' Creed, part of our catechesis. They made some intentional decisions in the liturgical rites of Lutheran service book to have the Apostles' Creed presented in question and answer form for the rite of holy baptism. And then confirmation, shorthand for confirmation of baptism, the confirmands speak it themselves. So I love how, how that works. Liturgically, how do we see the Apostles' Creed? Um, one of the test versions of what we call Divine Service Setting 3, or page 15, recommended that during the green seasons that the Apostles' Creed could be used, confessed, at Divine Service. I was not used to that tradition. Uh, your mileage may vary. The Nicene Creed, specifically the 325 Nicene Creed. Now, like the old Roman creed, you will note some differences between the two. The, what we know as the Nicene Creed is a slight revision of this from AD 381. But this is as adopted uh, at Nicaea, AD 325, that LCMS convention, uh, in English translation. We believe in one God. The Father Almighty, maker of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, begotten from the Father, only begotten, that is, from the substance of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one substance with the Father, through whom all things came into being, things in heaven and things on earth, who because of us men and because of our salvation came down, and became incarnate and became man and suffered and rose again on the third day and ascended to the heavens and will come to judge the living and dead and in the Holy Spirit. But as for those who say, there was when he, note the capital H, was not, and before being born he was not, and that he came into existence out of nothing, or who assert that the Son of God is of a different hypostasis or substance, or created, or is subject to alteration or change, 
these the Catholic and Apostolic Church anathematizes. That is just fun to say, anathematizes, eternally condemns to hell. So we end up having a plural at the beginning because this is an official doctrinal statement of that confession. I don't know if they had to adopt the two-thirds majority, but really there were only a couple of dissenters, contrary to what Dan Brown in the Da Vinci Code will tell you. I also like that you have, we believe in one God, and you have Father, Christ, and you have spirit there in separate indentations. It is very odd for many people to see so little pneumatology, so little on the Holy Spirit. But this, um, this council, this church convention, really focused on who is Jesus. What is his substance? And it confesses from the substance of the Father, of one substance with the Father. And Christians sometimes invent words in order to truly confess what's going on here. One of the things that um, TV likes to do, especially um, PBS, the History Channel, Discovery Channel, und so weiter, uh, is shock you tell you things like your pastor isn't telling you the whole truth. He's not willing to show you these ancient documents that we're going to show you. Stay tuned. He's not going to tell you that the word Trinity isn't, the word Trinity is not in the Bible. Hi, my name is Paul Kane. I'm a pastor. The word Trinity is not in the Bible. But what they did was that cookie monster trick from Sesame Street, right? Try unity. Try unity. Trinity. The idea is in the scriptures. Matthew 28. We invented a word as a shorthand in order to confess that. And so too, they have um, specific theological language to confess uh, of one substance with the Father not of a similar substance or of a different substance from the Father. One of the delegates, one of the bishops at 325 Nicaea was a fellow named Nicholas. He was uh, from a town called Myra in the nation we call today Turkey, so ancient Asia Minor, and he was there and he slapped one of the other delegates. Because one of the other delegates, not our friend, Arius, was confessing weird things, hence the bottom paragraph there. So, Nicholas gave rise to certain legends, pious and otherwise. Sant Niklaus, I saw Santa slapping Arius. Now there's more to that story, but instead of having children sit on Santa's lap and Santa ask them, have you been a good boy or girl? And then asking what they want for Christmas, I think it would be more accurate to history uh, for the mall and the um, Cabela's Santas to ask children, so have you been going to divine service and reciting your catechism? And if not, giving them a spanking right there. <laughs> mom and dad too, right? Yeah, mom and dad too. Um, I, I appreciate where you're coming from. Uh, perhaps your motivation is, I'm sick of only being able to discipline the children. I'd like to discipline the parents too. So, original Nicene Creed 325. The follow-up convention at Constantinople happened in 381. We've talked about Nicholas and Arius. And as we look at the text of the Nicene Creed, uh, I would like you to focus on the third article of the Nicene Creed. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshiped and glorified, and who spoke by the prophets. 
and I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism from the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. There is a phrase, and the son, filio que, in the original, that is rejected by the East. It is a later Western addition to what we call the third article of the Nicene Creed, uh, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. I've always wondered, and uh, perhaps you or, or other scholars could help with this, we have who proceeds from the Father and the Son. I wonder if the East would even accept who proceeds from the Father and sent by the Son to use more of the language that we have in the Gospel according to St. John. But at this point, so far removed from the original debate, it's practically a badge of honor that we're not going to filio quae in um, Greek or Orthodox churches. One of the other language things that you will find both um, here and in the words of institution is the word remission, right? Language changes over time. We know this uh, when, whenever we hear the 1611 King James or authorized version of the scriptures. Remission has a very specific medical connotation with regard to cancer. Your cancer goes into remission. Is this a good thing? Yavol, it is. But, you know what I'm going to say next, right? The cancer could return. So, for the remission of sins, this was intended <laughs> to be comforting. But we do not want our sins to return. Hence, a different translation, maybe even just forgiveness, uh, when we talk about um, that concept. Here's a fun little picture. It's not as high resolution as I would like, but the dudes with the beards, it, it does look really cool. All right, next up, we have the Athanasian Creed. Uh, circa 6th through 8th century. We need to be extra sensitive, especially for misunderstanding of this particular creed. Uh, and you have, not once, but twice, whoever desires to be saved must above all hold the Catholic faith. Please note the lower case C. It means something different than uh, Papa in Rome. And the very, very last lines, verses, stanzas, um, however you want to designate it. This is the Catholic faith. Whoever does not believe it faithfully and firmly cannot be saved. Allow the creed to define Catholica. Allow the creed to define what we mean. You're not going to hear very much about Mary in here. I mean, there's only a, a tangential um, allusion to her. There's nothing about obedience to a pope. There's nothing about Rome in here. There's nothing about incense or even vestments, if we're going to get ridiculous. So um, Athanasius was a defender of the Trinity. That is the major issue that uh, he fought in his day. This creed is named in honor of him, it was not composed by him. It is a Western creed, uh, primarily us in the Christian West, not confessed in the East, or so I've been taught, and a traditional time to confess it is at Matins on Trinity Sunday. I read a whole brand new blog post about this leading up to Trinity Sunday, thanks to Facebook. Uh, we did confess it at prayer and preaching. Our congregation has weekly communion, including Wednesday nights, but not yet every Sunday communion. I do have this dream that someday we will have uh, either matins or morning prayer 
and divine service alternating between an early and a late service. We now have an assistant pastor, so maybe this could be a thing uh, for us. We are to be careful about properly understanding what this creed confesses, not pertaining to works righteousness, but what Christians do by faith in Christ. Um, Christ's own teaching in the Gospel according to Matthew is handy on this. And then I found this beautiful graphic. So we have God, we have is, you've got Father, Son, Spirit, and you have non est, is not. You may see that in an English translation, but not as pretty as that stained glass window. Focusing particularly on who Christ is and what he has done for us, we hear, but it is also necessary for everlasting salvation that one faithfully believe the incarnation of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, it is the right faith that we believe and confess that our Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, is at the same time both God and man. He is God, begotten from the substance of the Father before all ages. This is consistent with Nicaea and Constantinople. And he is man born from the substance of his mother in this age. Not named, but he's got a mother. Perfect God and perfect man, composed of a rational soul and human flesh, equal to the Father with respect to his divinity, less than the Father with respect to his humanity. Although he is God and man, he is not two but one Christ. One, however, not by the conversion of the divinity into flesh, but by the assumption of the humanity into God. One altogether, not by confusion of substance, but by unity of person. For as the rational soul and flesh is one man, so God and man is one Christ, who suffered for our salvation, descended into hell, rose again on the third day from the dead, ascended into heaven, and is seated at the right hand of the Father, from whence he will come to judge the living and the dead. So great comfort we have of what Christ has done for us, uh, especially in the Athanasian Creed. So these are called the ecumenical universal creeds. Um, any thoughts, any questions before we proceed on to... Just one small point. I noticed on the Nicene Creed of 325 it used capital C. Is that on purpose? Um, I think that's just uh, because I typed it in wrong. Okay. So, my bad. Or, to be better, mea culpa, mea culpa, mea maxima culpa. <laughs> Thank you. The Te Deum. But wait, that's not in the Book of Concord. Luther always thought this was a fourth creed. Uh, this is what we sing at, uh, at Matins. It's an alternate, according to LW, LBW, and uh, if you find the right rubric in Lutheran service book, the uh, LW and LBW to Deum, which is very difficult, is found in the back of Lutheran service book. Luther considered it a creed, though not in the Book of Concord, and I just thought that was fun for us to include. One question with that. Yeah. Occasionally I hear pastors say they want to substitute the Tadam for the creed at certain, in certain times of the church here. Your thoughts? Um, it could be considered an innovation, but it is something that uh, Luther may well have understood. I'd, I'd encourage caution maybe discussing that at Winkle, so that uh, visitors wouldn't be scandalized. I like to use Winkle's as doctrinal review and casuistry. Um, our own Dr. Tallman has a proposal on how to classically do casuistry at Winkle. So maybe that could be a pattern for discussing that topic as well as others. Ah. But anyway, go on. Well, Sorry. my condolences. Regarding subscription to the Lutheran confessions, confessional Lutherans hold to a quia because, rather than a quatenos, insofar as subscription to the Book of Concord. 
And here's a quote from Luther. Uh, you can find this on the Concordia Theological Seminary Fort Wayne website. It's Walther's essay, Why Subscribe Unconditionally to the Symbolical Books. He says, in English translation, an unconditional subscription is the solemn declaration which the individual who wants to serve the church makes under oath that he accepts the doctrinal content of our Lutheran confessions because he recognizes the fact that they are in full agreement with Scripture and do not militate against Scripture in any point, whether the point be of major or minor importance, and that he therefore heartily believes in this divine truth and is determined to preach this doctrine. You'll hear at an ordination, at an installation, a pastor confess, and I have made them my own. Are any of you rostered LCMS teachers? Did you have to make that subscription? This is a question that I'm uncertain about in my mind. I would still recommend it for teachers um, because we want, um, we want those in our classroom teaching the Word of God to know what Lutheran means, not just a name on a door, a name on a, a school, a name on a contract, but what we be truly believe, teach, and confess. The Book of Concord, even Luther's small catechism with explanation, is not for us another testament of Jesus Christ, that you would have roving Lutheran missionaries between their uh, high school and college years go and try to evangelize like the Mormons do in the West. Uh, the Book of Concord is the norma normata, the normed norm, the standard that is secondary to another one. Compared to how we regard the Bible, the norma normans, the norming norm. It is the standard, the only source of Christian doctrine, God's authoritative word. So we do not have our creeds on the same level as Scripture, but uh, Scripture is always the only source of true, pure Christian teaching and practice. The Gospel in the Augsburg Confession. We've finally gotten to this point. Uh, I've got 10.53, we go into 11.20, and let's do some sample readings in the Augsburg Confession after we take a look at some review of what this is. Presented on June 25th, 1530, written by Philip Melanchthon, he was there present. Why was Luther not there? Well, people could have killed him under church law and under civil law, not divine law. You should know that Melanchthon kept tinkering with the thing. So at least my perspective on Confessions 1 versus Confessions 2, as it was taught to me at Concordia Seminary St. Louis in the late 90s, Confessions 1, Melanchthon good. Confessions 2, Melanchthon bad. Now, very simplistic, but some of us are very simple people. The unaltered Augsburg Confession is the one we are so passionate about. We want the original, not the duplicate, not a, mem a Memorex. We want the original one, not one so altered and watered down that John Calvin himself is said to have subscribed to it. If you've ever seen on a church cornerstone, Lord willing, yours, or a church that you see built during your lifetime, you a C, unaltered Augsburg Confession. That is um, an architectural tip from me to you. And abbreviated as AC or CA um, for the Latin way of saying this. There's a little picture of uh, the proceedings and some recommended articles that we should take a look at. Pastor Castellero and I, back on the 25th of uh, June, did a tag team Bible study where we read through as far in the Augsburg Confession with questions and answers as we could, and uh, we didn't get very far. So I'd like to keep us focused. Uh, 
you should read the whole thing. In fact, I'll give you a schedule on how to do so in 40 days, soon or next Lent. There are also reading schedules in the reader's edition here, McCain, Concordia, the Lutheran Confessions. But let's look at Article 2 on Original Sin. It begins on page 31, at least in the edition that I'm using. And please note, after you have Article 2, you've got the topic, you've got some squiggly lines, you've got note, and then an explanation from the editors at CPH. This is one of the things they adjusted between the first and second edition of this particular uh, version. Some folks were confusing the notes for the actual text. Could I have a volunteer read Article 2 down there at the bottom of the page? Our churches teach that since the fall of Adam, all who are naturally born are born with sin, that is, without the fear of God, without trust in God, and with the inclination to sin called concupiscence. Concupiscence is a disease, an original vice that is truly sin. It damns and brings eternal death on those who are not born anew through baptism and the Holy Spirit. Our churches condemn the Pelagians and others who deny that original depravity is sin, thus obscuring the glory of Christ's merit and benefits. Pelagians argue that a person can be justified before God by his own strength and freedom. If Pelagianism is true, if Pelagius is right, and you can save yourself, then Christians don't need Jesus. That's very depressing. Um, the only thing worse than a Pelagian, according to my professor, was a semi-Pelagian, someone who believes you contribute to saving yourself. So here's a little Lutheran math. Jesus plus Anything is a problem when you add something to what Jesus has done for you. That's a big problem. Take a look at Article 3 regarding the Son of God. Our churches teach that the Word, that is the Son of God, assumed the human nature in the womb of the Blessed Virgin Mary. So there are two natures, the divine and the human, inseparably joined in one person. There is one Christ, true God and true man, who was born of the Virgin Mary, truly suffered, was crucified, died, and was buried. He did this to reconcile the Father to us and to be a sacrifice, not only for original guilt, but also for all actual sins of mankind. As we go along, you'll see how many um, ancient and medieval Christological heresies they're trying to counter. He also descended into hell and truly rose again on the third day. Afterward, he ascended into heaven to sit at the right hand of the Father. There he forever reigns in his dominion over all creatures. He sanctifies those who believe in him by sending the Holy Spirit into their hearts to rule, comfort, and make them alive. He defends them against the devil and the power of sin. The same Christ will openly come again to judge the living and the dead and so forth, according to the Apostles' Creed. I'm very curious... Uh, regarding lines 4 and 5, what the Eastern Orthodox, the Greek Orthodox, thought when the Lutherans sent them a Greek copy of the Augsburg Confession. This kind of screams filioque to me. So we get to Jesus really, really quickly, Article 2 in the Augsburg Confession. Um, if you do not have your own Book of Concord yet, you can go to bookofconcord.org you're going to be reading a very similar free translation. It's the one from the big, thick Concordia Triglata book I have here, uh, 1921 Concordia Publishing House. Concordia the Lutheran Confessions is a modest update of that for our day. Article 4 is justification. It is brief, but the apology, the defense of this, oh, just wait till we get there. How about a volunteer for Article 4? It is also taught among us that we cannot obtain forgiveness of sin and righteousness before God by our own merits, works, or satisfactions, but that we receive forgiveness of sin and become righteous before God by grace, for Christ's sake, through faith, when we believe that Christ suffered for us and that for his sake our sin is forgiven and righteousness and eternal life are given to us. For God will regard and reckon this faith as righteousness, 
as Paul says in Romans 3 and 4. It's important to note that this, the scriptural support and source that these articles have. Sometimes there are allusions to scripture passages. And one important thing that I haven't mentioned yet, uh, there, at the time of the writing of the Confessions, verse numbers were not in common use. They used chapter numbers. And even, uh, there is even some uh, difference of opinion on the division of chapter numbers. I kind of wonder if the old story is true that the fellow figured it out on horseback. Uh, we noted this in the end of Daniel 3 and the beginning of Daniel 4, when you have that whole Nebuchadnezzar mess. Uh, there's a difference between different um, manuscripts of where the chapter break is. Uh, same scriptures, just the different street and avenue address, if you will. The notes I particularly appreciate in this edition, and other editions also have similar notes, that will show you parallel passages in the confessions in a similar way to the center column that you'll find in some editions of the Bible. We'll give you parallel passages, and for more on this subject, go here. Uh, you'll, you'll note that here. Article 5, the ministry. There's a paperback, and it's called like sources and documents of the sources and context. Yes, yes. sources and context of the Lutheran confessions. Well worth it when you read the Roman Catholic Confutation. Exactly. You figure out why you go from this to the apology. <laughs> there's also another volume. So there's a paperback blue one and a paperback green volume that are designed to go with Kolb Wingert but you can use them with any edition of the Lutheran Confessions. The computations on Lutheranconcord.org as well. It is. Awesome. From apology, or you can go from the AC to the reputation to apology, I think. Nice. There, at least there's a website that puts all three kind of next to each other real easy. Oh, that'd be handy. That'd be great. Uh, can I ask you a question? Please. I'm new to classical education, um, so I, I wanted to ask kind of a logic question. Okay. Uh, there's a circular argument in Article 4, and... You know, we're okay with that, teaching that, because it's true. But someone new to this might look at it and say, well, it says you're forgiven when you believe that you're forgiven. You're forgiven when you believe that you're forgiven. That's just, that's, that's a circular argument. That's bad logic, right? Now, is, that, is that an oversimplification of it, or? I might say it's an oversimplification of it. I might go in a little different direction. That it's, got... it's objective and subjective justification that it's talking about. Yes. someone new to it for the first time might say, that seems wrong because we don't argue that way. Well, in this case, we do because of the distinction between objective and subjective. Right. And the thing that always trumps reason or logic is the divine word of God. So that's, um, that's basically where I would go. That when God says, let there be light, and there was light, uh, there's the joke about scientists trying to create life in the laboratory, and the divine, according to the joke, says, use your own dirt, because he created out of nothing. So God's word creates a reality, and we're going to go with what he says over and above, whether it totally makes sense to reason, logic, rhetoric, or even grammar. And there are many tensions like that in Lutheran theology. Um, something you already know, of course. So they're, they're mostly going off of what the scripture says rather than necessarily a classical presentation of formal or informal logic, for that matter. Yeah, I did bring with me, I don't know why I did, it just seemed like a good idea at the time, a book on uh, fallacies and bad logic. And for some reason, I decided to mention some in tomorrow morning's sermon. Like uh, guilt by association. That's, that's bad reasoning. <laughs> okay, Article 5 connects directly with 4. So that we may obtain this faith, the ministry of teaching the gospel and administering the sacraments was instituted. Through the word and sacraments, as through instruments, the Holy Spirit is given. He works faith when and where it pleases God and those who hear the good news. 
that God justifies those who believe that they are received into grace for Christ's sake. So we do have a recapitulation of uh, what you were mentioning in Article 4. This happens not through our own merits, but for Christ's sake. And we get a little more emphasis on who's doing the doing there. It's, it's the good Lord. Our churches condemn the Anabaptists and others who think that through their own preparations and works, the Holy Spirit comes to them without the external word. So, Anna means again. These are not the modern Baptists as in Southern American uh, Baptist, but these are folks that we might refer to today as Amish or Mennonites. That's the, the 16th century group that we're talking about there. There are many we would call enthusiasts or fanatics. So be careful saying that you're a Nebraska Cornhuskers football fan because there's fanatical uh, connections to that. Um, Luther joked about such, such folks that uh, they swallowed the spirit feathers and all. And uh, you gotta love Lutheran humor as we go along there. I need, need to uh, grab my cord here. Go ahead and skip ahead to the apology of the Augsburg Confession. I want to cover at least a little bit of that, uh, in particular Article 4, before we have to break for your next session. And then we can pick up with Small Called, uh, focus on a lot of Luther's writing. I want to introduce you to the prefaces of the catechisms, because most people in my experience haven't read them, and they are so foundational to what we do as pastors and teachers. So as mentioned in our overview yesterday, and re-mentioned by one of the brothers here, the apology of the Augsburg Confession, the defense of the Augustana, is itself a response to a Roman Catholic document called the Confutation. Uh, May 1531, it's by Melanchthon, and it is defending the original teaching. So I'm using the May 1531 original edition because that is what most editions of the Lutheran Confessions use. It is the larger page quarto edition, so-called, compared to the September 1531 octavo edition. So half the size of the page uh, is the September edition, which is the textual basis for the translation of the Apology in Kolb Wingert, the year 2000 edition of the Lutheran Confessions. Uh, Robert Kolb, one of our Missouri Synod guys, uh, Timothy Wingert, ELCA, and published by Fortress Press. They will identify with the italicized portions uh, additions of the um, octavo compared to the quarto. Did I get that right? There is a distinction that they still try to maintain. So when we engage in apologetics in defending the faith, um, why have Lutherans not used the apology to do apologetics? I've always wanted to ask that question. The longest section of the Apology is on justification. It happens to be on page 82 in Concordia of the Lutheran Confessions. Otherwise, just keep making a right turn until you see uh, Article 4, Justification, in your section on the Apology. That's where I would like to focus. And that tiny little picture on the slide is a woodcut of uh, a title page from the period. This is the most complex article in the Book of Concord. I wish we had about three hours just to cover this. So if what I share sounds a little simplistic, um, well, 
just based on the time that we have. Um, that's why. So in articles 4, 5, 6, and 20, they, the Roman Catholics, condemn us for teaching that, quote, people obtain forgiveness of sins not because of their own merits, but freely for Christ's sake through faith in Christ, end quote. Man, if I'm going to be condemned by anybody for anything, that's what I want to be condemned for. And if you look at um, the examination of the Council of Trent by Chemnitz, they are anathematizing us and others for things the scriptures teach regarding salvation, faith in Christ, uh, the relation of good works to such things. They condemn us both for denying that people obtain forgiveness of sins because of their own merits and for affirming that through faith, people obtain forgiveness of sins and are justified through faith in Christ. But in this controversy, the chief topic of Christian doctrine is treated. When it is understood correctly, it illumines and amplifies Christ's honor, which is especially useful for the clear, correct understanding of the entire Holy Scriptures, and alone shows the way to the unspeakable treasure and right knowledge of Christ, and alone opens the door to the entire Bible. It brings necessary and most abundant consolation to devout consciences. Now comes the sugar. Therefore, we ask His Imperial Majesty, who's that? Charles V. Charles V, that's right. There's a lot of language of court, of patronage, of there's a variety of ways to explain it, where you're trying to get the favor, you're trying to convince somebody, um, sometimes in your documents, and this is an attempt. Therefore, we ask His Imperial Majesty to hear us with patience in matters of such importance. For the adversaries do not understand what the forgiveness of sins, or faith, or grace, or righteousness is. Boom. They said it. They don't even know the gospel. Therefore, they sadly corrupt this topic, hide Christ's glory and benefits, and rob devout consciences of the consolation offered in Christ in order that we may strengthen the position of our confession and also remove the charges that the adversaries advance against us, certain points are to be set forth in the beginning. Then the sources of both kinds of doctrine, that of our adversaries and our own, may be known. In defense of the Augsburg Confession, you have the apology, but you also have what's in the appendix as the catalog of testimonies where the Lutheran confessors prove from the church fathers that what they're doing is not new, but has been believed, taught, and confessed from the scriptures against what is then current and technically still current Roman Catholic teaching. How about that paragraph that begins with five in the margin? All scripture? All scripture ought to be distributed into these two principal topics, the law and the promises. <clears throat> For in some places scripture presents the law, and in others the promises of our Christ. In other words, in the Old Testament, scripture promises that Christ will come, and it offers for his sake the forgiveness of sins, justification, and life eternal. For in the gospel, in the New Testament, Christ himself, since he has appeared, promises the forgiveness of sins, justification, and life. Eternal, life eternal. Furthermore, in this discussion, by law, we mean the Ten Commandments. Wherever they are read in the Scriptures, we say nothing at present about the ceremonies and judicial laws of Moses. They will get to that. Lutherans write about those sort of things, too. So, Finding the source of our teaching, it's going to be scripture. Not reason, not human opinion, not church conventions, not a pope, president, superintendent, bishop, whatever, uh, what have you. Uh, and we are properly going to distinguish between the law and the gospel, or the law and the promises. 
In a classical Lutheran school, like other typical Lutheran schools in the Missouri Synod and other church bodies today, you're going to have maybe a fraction of your church body from your congregation and other association congregations, right? You're going to have a lot of non-Lutherans in your desks. This, this is very, very common. I've found it very interesting over the years what the reaction of the parents are to us being who we are as confessional, liturgical, faithful Lutherans, and the reaction of the children to some of the same topics. You know, it's pretty cool when a kindergartner, itty bitty little girl, corrects the Latin pronunciation of her mother. You know, that's, that's just cool. But when you have Baptist girls go to their worship pastor and ask, could we do matins sometime? Life just got awesome. <laughs> or when you have um, the daughter of an antinomian, non-Lutheran, American evangelical pastor stand up to answer the question at chapel, what are the two main teachings of Holy Scripture? And she goes, law and gospel. Yeah. Awesome. There's a little more we should read here. Picking up with seven, of these two parts of scripture, the adversaries choose the law because in some way human reason naturally understands the law for it has the same judgment divinely written in the mind. By the law they seek the forgiveness of sins and justification. The Ten Commandments require outward civil works which reason can in some way produce, but they also require other things placed far above reason. Truly to fear God, truly to love God, truly to call upon God, truly to be convinced that God hears us and to expect God's aid in death and in all afflictions. Finally, the law requires obedience to God in death and all afflictions so that we may not run from these commandments or refuse them when God lays them upon us. The Apology, Article 4 in Concordia, the Lutheran Confessions keeps going on. We're on page 83. It keeps going till page 102. And even if they left out the woodcuts, as they do in the little pocket edition, uh, which is a shame, this is long compared to that one paragraph Augsburg Confession article that we, that we had. So in talking about the gospel in the Lutheran confessions, I've focused on gospel-oriented or proper distinction of law and gospel-oriented passages in addition to attempting to give you an overview of the whole thing. I've got a handout for you at the very end. Some of you really already have it if you've got a reading list in your um, Book of Concord, but uh, it will help you be encouraged to continue on with what we've been doing uh, these two days beyond tomorrow when we try to look at small called the treatise the small catechism the large catechism and both parts of the formula of concord so that's all we're going to do tomorrow <laughs> any thoughts questions comments before we call it a day all right, thank you for the extra few minutes at the, build, at the beginning. Um, thank you for coming back. Pray we'll see you tomorrow.